Hello and welcome to episode 25 of DM's Guide to Tomb Annihilation. On to this episode, we're going to discuss the Sewn Sisters right here, how to use them in combat, and how you can use the Sewn Sisters throughout your campaign of Tomb Annihilation. After the Sewn Sisters are defeated, and you gain access to this door here, I'm then going to discuss the battle with this atrophile. And this is where the campaign starts to go towards its rather explosive climax. And again, guys, if you do enjoy this content, remember to like and subscribe. And if you're feeling generous, there's a Patreon link in the description below. So now it's time to discuss these night hags. So from my experience, I believe these night hags are almost even more important than the Sarek himself in this campaign because the night hags, these sewn sisters, have been following your characters from Port Nazaru. They'll be watching your characters sleep, they'll be just causing chaos for the entirety of the campaign. So as I said before, these Sewn Sisters are three night hags that have been hired by Serac because of their expertise with knitting soul bags. So we have these three Sewn Sisters. We have Widow Groat, who has tarnished gold coins covering her eyes, and ants nesting in her skull. These ants serve as spies, and you can use them to foreshadow her arrival. Each of these Sewn Sisters are going to have a Heartstone, which means that it allows them to teleport with an action to the Theo Plane. They have a Soul Bag, and Widow Groat has an Iron Ring with 8 keys. These keys are used to unlock the shackles of Aserax D40s in Area 78, which I'll hopefully describe in the next episode. Peggy Deadbells wears a string of chattering children's teeth and thumps around in a heavy peg leg. And when she laughs, she lets off a yellow gas bells from her nose and ears. Around her neck, she wears a pouch made of gnome skin, and again, she has a heartstone, but most importantly, she has five lustrous black marbles. This will allow your player characters to leave the Tomb of the Nine Gods. And again, she's also got a soul bag. And our final sewn sister, we have Baggy Nana. She has a squirming leather sack sewn over her head. The bag contains a cockerel, a viper, and a terrier. One of these animals will emerge from the bag and will speak on her behalf, replacing her head. These animals become smoke when Baggy Nana dies, and again she has a heartstone, a soul bag, and she has three goblin fingers. And because we are dealing with hags, they have access to coven spells, which is really important. My biggest pet peeve in the entire campaign is you have these three very, very interesting characters, and they have such in-depth descriptions, but there is no art of them in the book or anywhere online. If I had to ask which of the hosts one thing, can you please give us art for these characters because they are such a main part of the campaign. It would be very good to show my players and show your players what they look like. As in, I really want to see a night hag with ants calling her skull. Also, I very do like the Baggy Nana description with this leather sack with random animals appearing at different times. It's very, very important to explain foreshadowing because these Sewn Sisters are very intelligent. They also have the knowledge of making clones of your player characters which means they know everything about them, what spells they use, what they use in combat. And because of this, they will fight appropriately for this. So with these Night Hags, they have an armor class 17. They have a hit point of 112, which is not much. They have spell casting and they have various actions. So by themselves, they can cast Magic Missile, Detect Magic, or even Vulement Sleep, and they have resistance to magic. Personally, I would use Magic Missile only to break concentration of a Sorcerer or a Wizard. They're able to go into the old plane with an action, which is very important. They're resistant to cold fire, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks. And they're immune to being charmed. With their action, they also have a chain shape ability. However, these hags are not going to summon themselves as beautiful females. They're going to show their true forms. From my experience, I think the most important action they can do is nightmare hunting. During this campaign, your characters are going to sleep in this tomb if they can to regain their health hit points, perhaps level up. These hags will know exactly where your characters are at all points from the Tomb of the Nine Gods. So what I would get you to do is if your characters have their first sleep and they don't have any precautions, they're going to do the nightmare hunting on them. And the way nightmare hunting works is while on the ethereal plane, the hag magically touches a sleeping humanoid. The only way to stop this is protection from evil and good spell or a magic circle. As long as this contact persists, the target has dreadful visions. These visions last for at least one hour, and the main thing with this is your target gains no benefit from the rest, which means they don't regain hit points, they don't get spell slots back, and their hit point maximum is reduced by 1d10. And due to the Soulmonger's effect, you will never be able to get your hit points back up to maximum 
until the Soulmonger is destroyed. So let's say your characters try to have, let's say, three long rests in the tomb. If this happens three times, they'll lose 3d10 hit points, which is massive. And let's say that your characters are very, very weak and they go to sleep with, let's say, 10 hit points. If they're killed with this effect, their soul will be trapped within the hag's soul bag. So with these night hags in combat, the main thing is that by themselves, there's not really much they can do at that point in time. However, they will be preparing themselves and night hags come into their own when they have access to coven spells. So if all three members of the hag coven are within 30 feet of each other, they can cast these following spells. So they have a sixth level spell, Eye Bite. They have two fifth level spell slots. They have Polymorph, Kerner Spell and Lightning Bolt. And the way I would explain this is because they have to be within 30 feet of each other, it means that you could have one or two of these night hags in the ethereal plane as one will cast a spell. The Hag Coven also has a hag eye, which Mr. Thaniel will have. And let's say that your characters have fireballed him in the first encounter with the trial of the hexagon. The Hag eye only has 10 AC, one hit point, which means an air effect spell will destroy this hag eye, which means that all of these hag members would take 3d10 psychic damage and be blinded for 24 hours. The way I ran this combat was that my player character decided it's a really good idea to have a long rest before entering this room on the sixth level and doing these trials. So what I did was as soon as they tried to do their long rest, that's when I got these night hags to do a surprise attack. Because they can't do much damage with the action economy, if your characters are level 12, level 11, they will destroy these night hags very, very quickly. You need all three of these hags to be alive to cast any of these coven spells. So the main thing with this is that they're not going to save spell slots when they attack. They're going to attack with their best spells. So personally, I would use the spell I Bite. What we can do with this spell is you can make player characters fall asleep when they fail a save. If this doesn't work, the next thing we'll use would be Polymorph. The reason why I'm doing this is because if you take one player out of combat, you massively reduce the damage they can do per turn. To be thematic with hags, I would change your player characters into a frog. Because Polymorph is a concentration spell and has a duration of one hour, if it does get triggered, what you can do is you can get your night hag to go back into the ethereal plane and it means that your player characters can't break their concentration. If you want to really surprise your characters, what you could potentially do is you can do an air of effect spell. So you could trigger off Lightning Bolt and you can upcast it to level five perhaps leave your 6th level spell slot of eye bite, but you want to keep as many slots as possible to use counter spell. And also, because the hags know exactly what your player characters can do, they will be able to counter appropriately. So if they know that you have 3 spell casters, they'll keep counter spell. If they know that they have lots of people that can deal with lots of damage in close combat, they'll use ranged spell attacks. And also because they know them and they have literally made clones of your player characters, they'll know what they're good at. So they'll know if they're wise, they're intelligent, they're strong, but most importantly, they'll know their weaknesses. But let's think back to why your night hags are attacking. The reason they're attacking is to prevent your player characters from opening this door and accessing the room with the Soulmonger and the file. So what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to steal one of the five skeleton keys to open this door and escape to the ethereal plane. And if they do escape to the ethereal plane, you're going to have to follow them. The way you can follow these night hags in the ethereal plane is with Straw Bundle's charm. And because these night hags have created these dolls, I would say these night hags wouldn't attack these dolls deliberately. And also you need to understand that night hags are strong and they have massive egos. So they'll believe that even though these player characters are strong, they might believe they're stronger. So the way this ran with my campaign was that these night hags surprised and my player characters had a large amount of spell slots remaining and we had a rogue swashbuckler who can do ridiculous amounts of damage very quickly. So within the first round we had one night hag who was already slain and they lost their coven spells. And because we lost one night hag, it just made this game much, much harder for night hags to win. Very quickly the second night hag was slain and you're left with this last night hag. Since night hags are intelligent creatures, they will beg for their lives. So what happens if you leave one alive? 
She's not going to fight to the death, she's going to give out secrets and make contracts. So with the third night hag, when the other two hags die, she's going to bargain for her life and she'll tease and offer your player character useful information for the exchange of her own life. So once this contract's in place, if they accept this contract, she'll give this information. Hidden on this level of the dungeon is a library of lost lore, guarded by an arcana loth whose true name is Yaga Raksku. I do apologize if I said that name wrong. There's only one way to leave the dungeon. The Eberron Pool, charred bones point the way. So this is the only exit that will leave you out back into the jungle of Chult. And the final clue she'll give you is the red trail leads to death. This red trail will lead you back to Area 57 with Obelette. And as we discussed this before, if you're teleporting this room, you have a 50-50 chance of surviving or being sucked into oblivion. If your player characters decide to slay this night hag after they get this information, they will receive this curse. They will contract Slimy Doom as though they had failed the saving throw against a contagion spell. So with Slimy Doom, your characters will begin to bleed uncontrollably and they'll have disadvantage in constitution checks and constitution saving throws. And if they do take damage, they'll be stunned until the, the next turn. And with the contagion spell, it will last for a period of seven days. So the way I would rule this is that perhaps if you've got a cleric or a paladin that can cure disease, you can prevent this Slimy Doom. However, if you do get it and you have no way to stop it, the Slimy Doom will make the next fights incredibly difficult. This will most likely cause your player character to die. So just a quick recap of these night hags, they are intelligent, they will know exactly who your player characters are, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and they will fight properly to that. They'll most likely do a surprise turn when your characters finish the trials, and if you want to be very evil, you can attack them as soon as they finish the fifth trial. So let's say they're an octagon, and they just trigger the spinning blade and pull the lever in this door clicks, they could attack half the party while they're dealing with these traps or vice versa. They're going to use their high spell slots first because as soon as one of these hags die, which will be very, very quick, they'll lose their spell casting ability. The purpose of these night hags is to steal one of the skeleton keys to make it difficult for your player characters to open this door right here. Player characters will have the ability to use a feeling on this if they grab the doll straw bundle. They can follow the night hags into the ethereal plane. But as I said in the previous episode, with ethereal on this, only one character can go through. And again, in the comment section below, if you have any tips for dealing with these night hags, any interesting ways to foreshadow them, and if you can find any good artwork of them, please let me know in the comment section below. So we have dealt with the night hags and we're now going to go through this door and we're going to deal with the actual file and discuss the soulmonger in more detail. When your player characters defeat the night hags, the stone sisters, and complete the five trials and collect the five skeleton keys, they can open the skeleton gate. As you can complete these five trials, the triangle, the square, the pentagon, the hexagon and the octagon, and you collect all five of these skeleton keys and you open this door, your characters can push this forward and begin to go down to the next chamber. As your player characters open this door, your player characters now gain the access to the Death God's Nursery. As they descend a 10 foot wide, 20 foot long staircase of polished black marble, they look down and they can see crumbling balconies overlook a pool of lava, filling this triangular chamber above which is suspended an enormous crystal cylinder held in place by three adamantine struts. Wrath-like forms swirl inside the cylinder and otherworldly screams hang in the air. Four long writhing tentacles sprout from the cylinder's cap. A shriveled monstrosity the size of a whale floats near the cylinder. Its arms and legs are atrophied and its oversized head drips black goo. The creature is attached to the cylinder by a twisted umbilical cord. So as your player characters have finally arrived in this room, they can see their goal, and their entirety of goal of Tim Annihilation is to destroy this machine here, the Soulmonger. As soon as your player characters see this, they would all recognise this as such. They can see the swirling souls, and they can see this abomination. So this room is a two-stage boss battle, potentially. So if your characters come here and they succeed in their goal of destroying the Soulmonger, the death curse ends and everyone could be reincarnated, which is really, really important to know if they do do the boss battle. If they leave this Atrophile alive and they flee via this doorway at the end, they can leave the Tomb of the Night Gods. However, eh, most likely your player characters will kill this Atrophile and killing this Atrophile will summon a Serac, and this is when the two-stage boss battle will occur. This room has various elements. What I'm going to do is I'm going to break it down step by step. So the first thing I'm going to discuss 
the Soulmonger by itself, and what defenses it innately has. I'm then going to explain the Atrophile and how we'll fight in combat. And then in the next episode, I'm going to describe a Serac and the remains of this Tomb of the Nine Gods. So I'm going to warn you right now, it's going to be a rather large mouthful. So as soon as your player characters enter this room and after you, they have seen the Soulmonger and the Atrophile, they're going to get advice from every single Trickster Spirit. So with Fickle Engine, he encourages her host to investigate the misfilled archery in the south balcony. So this is the exit to the room. Adventurous Kubazan expects his host to make the ultimate sacrifice and die in a blaze of glory. Kain Moore wants to free the souls trapped inside the Soulmonger. Greedy Nang Nang urges her host to search the balconies and the bone-filled alcoves for treasure. These alcoves are full of phylacteries of various disciples of Serac. With Nerys Obalaka, it's concerned that the bones in the northern alcoves might rise up and attack. This won't be the case. Estrund Papazol suspects that Atrophil might be vulnerable to radiant damage and killing it might summon forth its evil master. Which is completely true. Vartris Shingambi recognises that Atrophil is unholy and orders her host to destroy it at once. Contemplative Unk urges her host to communicate with Atrophil perhaps the creature is just misunderstood. With my experience as in our sorcerer had Unk and she tried to open a conversation with this abomination of a relive god of death. This this conversation would take an action and a bonus action and it could potentially kill a player character by delaying this battle. Just so you know. And finally we have Derange Wongo, the final trickster spirit. He wants his host to attack the tentacles sprouting from the top of the soulmonger. So with this soulmonger, how do you destroy it and how can it kill your player characters? So the Soulmonger is an upright crystal cylinder of 20 feet high and it's 10 feet in diameter. Adamantian struts that suspend above the lava attach to an adamantian ring around the cylinder's midsection. If your characters are detect magic spell, this Soulmonger radiates an intense aura of necromantic magic. As I said before, destroying the Soulmonger not only ends the death curse, but also frees all the souls trapped within the device. Which means that you can revive your characters if they die in this boss battle if you destroy the Soulmonger. Soulmonger is an artifact of evil, a huge object with AC 15, 200 hit points, vulnerability to radiant damage, immunity bludging, piercing, slashing from non-magical attacks. As I said over and over again during these episodes, your characters should have magical weapons at this point. The Soulmonger is going to be held up by adamantine structs. If you destroy any of these struts, it will collapse and it will fall into the lava below. Each strut is a large object with an AC of 20, 100 hit points, and again, it has immunity to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks. So it's immune to fire because it's held above this lava and because it's an object it's immune to poison and psychic damage. And as a doctor to see your hit points it will break and this Soulmonger will fall. The shots are wide enough that a medium or a small creature can walk along them. However, if they take damage while on these struts they have to make a dexterity 10, dexterity saving throw or fall into the lava below. And again, if you break this strut as a character is standing on it, they'll also fall into the lava below as well. And just a quick recap of how much little damage lava does. So the lava pit is 30 feet below the floor of this room. It's 100 feet deep. And if you fall into the lava, you take Den D10 fire damage. So 55 points of fire damage. You can use this lava in many ways. You can use this with the Soulmonger Sentinels, which I'll explain right now. We can also use this lava to your advantage with the Serac fight as well, which I'll explain in the next episode. So you have these four tentacles that are on top of the Soulmonger, and these tentacles are going to attack anyone nearby the Soulmonger. They're 30 feet long, which means anything within 30 feet of the Soulmonger can be attacked. They are incredibly strong with 22 strength, it's a plus 7 to hit, and they do 48 bludgeoning damage. But the way I do this instead is instead of doing the damage, you'll grapple its target and you will dunk them in the lava below. So instead of doing your 4d8 bludgeoning damage, you do your 10d10 fire damage. And because you're dealing with tentacles, I assume that they won't be that intelligent, so they wouldn't know if your characters are resistant or immune to fire damage. And each of these tentacles have hit points of 30 and 15 AC, so you can destroy the tentacles one, one after another. So with 30 feet, these tentacles can attack the vast majority of this room. And the way that I'd run combat with these tentacles is that each of these tentacles will have a held action and they're going to go for option attack. So whenever a character goes in their reach, they'll make an option attack. So you don't have to roll initiative for these tentacles. They're just going to wait until someone goes to 30 feet. Once they go to 30 feet, you roll to hit and you'll just do that four times. So we have the Soulmonger in the center of I explained. You have these three Adamantine struts. And now we're going to talk about the Atrophile and this creature that is stealing 
and sucking all these souls from the soulmonger. So with his Atrophile, your characters will be rather surprised by this because it's not really foreshadowed in the campaign. They open this door, you'll see this machine of the soulmonger, and then you'll see this disgusting abomination. The Atrophile is what happens when you try to create a dead god. It's a flying bulbous state of decay that looks like an Atrophiled fetus. And as I said before, Tomb Annihilation is rather dark, some of your players might find this frankly disgusting. However, I personally wouldn't remove this from the campaign because it's such a terrible part of this boss battle. This Atrophile was a Serac's saying of why become a god when you can simply create gods. So Serac is currently filling this Atrophile so he can become a god of death. And it's up to yourself, will that succeed or is that just a failed experiment? So as your player characters see this and that trial sees your player characters, it's going to attack them the best it can. So what's the best way to run those Atrophile in combat? So the first thing is, it's huge. It has a really, really small armor class of 7, which means the hits are definitely going to hit. It actually has a very fast fly speed of 50 feet, but it is attached to the Soulmonger by an umbilical cord. So what I'll say is that its umbilical cord is long enough where it can attack anything in this room, but it can't flee the room. Its dexterity is very low, however, all the other stats are very, very high. Especially his intelligence, it's a very, very smart fetus of a 25 intelligence. High con, high charisma, high wisdom, and high strength. It's vulnerable to radiant, however, it is immune to cold, necrotic, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage from non-magical attacks. It can be exhausted, frightened, paralyzed, pointing to prone. It has true sight of 120 feet, which means you're not stealthing on this creature. And it has various abilities, and it has legendary actions. So the first thing we're going to talk about is its negative energy aura. Any creature within 30 feet of the Atrophile can't regain hit points, and any creature that starts its turn within 30 feet of the Atrophile takes 3d6 necrotic damage. So it's constantly going to be doing damage without taking any actions, legendary actions, or bonus actions. You can chop the umbilical cord with a vorpal sword. You shouldn't receive a vorpal sword in this campaign, but your players potentially might have got one if you did other missions outside the official book. If this umbilical cord is chopped, it will lose this negative energy aura. However, there's not any way your characters would get a vorpal weapon from the campaign, but good thing to know just in case. It has its turn resistance aura, which means this Atrophile can give any undead creature the advantage in saving throws against the effect of turn undead which is very important because this Atrophile's ability is that it can summon wraiths, which is really good to know. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to explain its actions, and then I'm going to go in more detail with its legendary actions. On his movement, is going to get within 30 feet of as many player characters as it can, so it can trigger this negative energy aura. And because we're constantly doing damage, it means that your spellcasters will have to constantly do concentration checks to maintain their concentration spells. And with his action, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to summon a wraith. And it's going to keep on trying to summon Wraith with every action. If it can't recharge it, it's going to do its life drain ability. I'll explain the life drain ability first, then I'm going to go to explain Wraiths in a moment. So with this life drain ability, your player characters have exceeded a DC 19 constitution saving throw or take 88 necrotic damage. And with this, even if they succeed, they'll take half damage. And most importantly, the Atrophile will regain a number of hit points equal to the half of the amount dealt. Which means that even though if they succeed or they fail, your player characters will be giving more health as Atrophile. And because it already has a large amount of hit points of 225, it will make the combat last longer. The longer the combat goes, the more damage this Atrophile will be doing with its passive abilities. And it'll have more chance to summon these wraiths. That will slowly whittle down your player characters. So what can a wraith do? So with a wraith, they have an armor class of 13, hit points of 67. They have an incredibly fast fly speed of 60 feet. And they have incomparable movement, which means they can fly through player characters at their, their difficult terrain. They're immune to necrotic and poison damage. They are resistant to acid, cold, fire, lightning, thunder. And of course, they're resistant to bludgeoning, piercing, slashing from non-magical attacks. They have two actions, so they can either do a life drain ability, or they can do a create spectre ability. So they can only create a spectre if a humanoid dies within 10 feet of it. So if any of your player characters die, they're going to use their action to create a spectre. If that doesn't happen, they're going to use their life drain ability. It's a plus six to hit. If it hits, they deal 21 points in average necrotic damage, and your characters must make a DC 14 concentration saving throw, or their hit point maximum is reduced by this amount. And because the Soulmonger is here, if the Soulmonger is not destroyed, they can never regain these hit points taken away by this maximum hit point reduction. So your cleric won't be able to heal, 
and the longer this battle runs, the lower hit points your player characters will have. And each turn, in a 1 to 6 chance, you'll summon another wraith, so this will stack, stack, and stack. So the quicker your players can kill this atrophile, the better it is. They don't want a long slog in this battle. So I've explained the action, so now I'm going to look over this, the legendary actions. The way I ran this, and because your characters are going to be fighting, I believe this fight should be very, very deadly. So I wouldn't use the touch action or the ray of cold he's going to use all his legendary points his three actions to do whale this atrophile lets out a weathering whale any creature within 120 feet of the atrophile that can hear the whale must exceed a dc 19 constituting saving throw or gain one point of exhaustion if this happens six times and your characters gain six level of exhaustions they will die and every single time they gain level of exhaustion it just makes the fight exponentially harder so with their first level of exhaustion, they get disadvantage in ability checks, which is not bad. Level 2, their speed is halved, which means they can't run away. Level 3, they get disadvantage on all attack rolls and saving throws. Level 4, their hit point maximum is halved, and if this happens, if the Soulmonger is still here, they can never go above their hit point maximum of half. Level 5, their speed reduced to zero, and level 6, they are dead. So with his Atrophile and this first stage of the final boss battle at the end of the Tomb of Annihilation, do you think there's anything else you would do in combat except for using this whale ability and life drain and summoning these wraiths? I also really want to hear how your player characters got on and did anyone die to the Atrophile? Did anyone get dunked in this lava below? So guys, again, thank you very much for watching. On the next episode, we're going to look at what happens if your player characters kill his Atrophile and how to flee the Tomb of the Nine Gods. And again, thank you so much for watching. We're very close to the end of this series now and any comments in this episode, feel free to find in the comment section below. And again, guys, if you enjoy this content, remember to like and subscribe. And if you're feeling generous, there's a Patreon link in the description below. And I'll see you the next time. Ciao.